welcome to our session on uh, the power of local journalism. My name is Edith Michaela. Um, I'm working at FUM Wien, a training institution for journalists in Vienna. And I'm very happy to share this wonderful podium with uh, Peter Laufer, who is professor at the University of Oregon School of Journalism, with Joost Lübben, editor-in-chief at the Westfalen Post, and Andy Haltenbrunner, um, Managing Director of Median House Wien, a Vienna-based um, scientific research house. Yeah. Um, when we um, started uh, compiling this panel, I realized that this is not only um, a panel of wonderful thinkers and analysts in journalism and media, but that you also have something in common apart from that, um, and it is that you're all not living in a big city. You're all living, Peter is living in, in, in Oregon, in Eugene, Oregon, which is a 200,000 inhabitant city in the northwest of the US. Joost is living in northwestern Germany in a rural area where he runs the, um, the newspaper and Andy is uh, living in Spain, somewhere in the mountains, I heard. <laughs> and so my first question, short question to, question to like to get you know better is, um, so the audience gets to know you better, I know you already, is um, as a consumer or as a reader or user of local news, how and where do you get in touch with local news? Andy. Well, for me, it's the regional websites, actually. So as you revealed that I'm living in a little town in, in, in Spain, so uh, well, Vienna is another thing, so it's really different, very different media consumption, information, uh, information gathering. So there, it's the local, regional, digital media mostly, with spe for special communities, and that's quite something else than living in in Vienna and having all the big national news and all the big channels. So there's really a big big difference. You can notably. Uh, work, we can, which are very important for our work also to see that difference. For, for me, it's uh, the newspaper I'm editor-in-chief of because uh, the city of Hagen, where I live, with uh, 200,000 people of population, um, is a city where my newspaper is the biggest one. And so if you are interested in local news, um, you sh should and can read uh, Westfalen Post and you can do it print and digital. Okay, and you, you as a consumer, so you... you Me as a consumer, uh, of course I'm interested in, uh, in my own media. Moreover, um, I read local blogs and all that stuff mm -hmm. I can get, sure. Okay, mm -hmm. and Peter? In uh, Eugene, at, at my house, uh, every morning early, the New York Times lands. It comes from Seattle where it's printed by truck Sometimes it's late when the snows are bad, but also the Eugene Register Guard is there. And the Eugene Register Guard has been family owned for over 90 years. It's a vibrant purveyor of news for the community and the family is tightly engaged in Eugene affairs. However, last month they sold to, I always have to look the name of the company up because I forget it, I think I want to forget it, to Gatehouse Media. And Gatehouse Media, as some of you may know, or many of you, owns a lot of regional newspapers, hundreds across the US, and they have a terrible reputation for sucking the blood out of local family-owned newspapers that they buy. Mm. So we, I, I can't quite answer your question, into the future of the next few months mm -hmm. because we are quite concerned that the vibrant news source that we've relied on will be eviscerated. But what you just, uh, does the, the, the example you gave, just jump, you jump just into the, into the topic we're discussing today, why, lo why are local news so powerful? And you told me about this example of, of your local news provider and um, Actually, when we when we talked before, you gave, you gave me like a very not not bad example. But could you tell us how in a in a, in a how is how our local news are threatened? Well, the example that we talked about that some of you may be aware of because it's relatively famous in the states occurred in 2002 in North Dakota in a small town where a Canadian Pacific Railroad train derailed 
and one of the carriages was punctured. It was carrying ammonia, and uh, this was a poisonous gas that escaped into the town. And the radio stations, the bulk of the radio stations in the town, six of them had been bought by a national conglomerate at the time called Clear Channel. They were serviced by a satellite feed, and so there was literally no one home at any of the six radio stations in the town that were owned by that company, and the police consequently could not get the word out that this poisonous gas mm -hmm. was in the air. One person died, over a thousand were injured. And it was an example of local news outlets being available, but being controlled, and this is more and more a problem in the United States, elsewhere, and consequently, the local news was not reported during this emergency. Okay, which is really, the, like this is something that local news is very strong at, like reporting on the ground. And so you used, um, in you, you have a different example. Your oh, yes, yeah. L luckily I, I don't share Peter's experience. Um, we cover uh, a huge region and we do have 13 local editions there and so we are all over the, um, the region uh, we do cover and so it means uh, we want to be everywhere and we want to cover any news which is on the market and what we want to do is to create a platform to discuss all the topics which are important uh, to the future of the people living there. Yeah. You're yeah. saying yeah. platform, what does it mean? How, how do it, does your uh, newspaper differ or how, what's, what's different to other regional or local newspapers? Well, it means, mm -hmm. uh, in, in my point of view, um, the times of simple and pure reporting, uh, these times are over. We have to think about what makes, uh, makes us indispensable as a regional newspaper. What are the point and points? And one point is, in my opinion, um, all all the people are seeking for answers concerning their personal future, their personal, their private future, their professional future, and um, we would like to be a professional partner to create this platform to debate all these topics, mm -hmm. and uh, that means we invite our people to talk with us and to be connected. Uh, we create great connection with politics mm -hmm. in the region uh, and we use all the channels uh, which are possible mm -hmm. to uh, create this, that discussion. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Andy, you did a research on uh, local journalism and comparing the United St local journalism in the United States and in Austria. And um, so do you, what, what were, the, were the key findings and yeah. did you also see a change in the perspective of journalists? Maybe let me see something first. So one interesting point we find also in research, in our research initiatives, which are not only Austrian, we are Austrian based, but we are comparing international systems and bringing back some of the info and the experience to Austria. But one thing is we had so much discussion and so much research on tech questions, on development, on innovation debates, et cetera, et cetera. And an interesting point I can see, and is that we're coming back to the basis of journalism very often again, to local journalism, to what does it really mean, how does it work, and uh, besides all the interesting shiny new things, as Lucy King calls them, the interesting technology developments. And that's, why is that so? Maybe, it is, and, and that we can find it in all the media cultures. So of course we are aware of the fact that media cultures are different and media development for local journalism, I don't know how many nationalities we have in the room, are different. So it depends, of course, on the market situation. In the US, we could follow over many years the so-called newspaperdeathwatch.org websites, where literally every week we found two or three uh, uh, media group, media, regional media, whatever, uh, closing after, after 2000. We didn't have that strong process here in Central Europe, not in Germany, not in Switzerland. Of course, we had concentration processes. We have some newspapers closing, but we had always had strong local regional papers. And 
as you mentioned, I'm also living in Spain, so uh, the Spanish situation where newspapers, for example, were not so important ever. So there's only 20, 30 percent of people reading a newspaper had been, whereas in Austria and Germany it's 60 or 70 percent. So that makes a big difference. Also for the digital developments there, where does it come from? Where's the niche for it? Where's the, where, where's the way to do it? This is the le legacy media who are responsible to make the platform, or is it completely new initiatives? We see more of that in Southern Europe than we see in Central Europe. So, so, yeah. So, so to, to, to make it short, to keep it short and simple, I prepared three or four slides. Don't worry, uh, it's not, I'm not boring you with data, so everybody can find that when, when, when contacting us. We are still working on it. But one question uh, we asked ourselves, let me see if we can get it online. Up. Somebody, yeah. I think somebody must help us to get it here on the. Oh. Under, under, under. But maybe you could just yeah. like in brief. Uh, yeah, well, brief, well, well, well one, one, one key question was uh, we put forward one key question was, well, it's coming, I think. I'm optimistic. Well, if not so, uh, I can do without that, uh, without slides, <laughs> without the, it's, it's only three or four of them. But one, one key point was that we, are, we were asking the journalists from different fields, so next, just next page, uh, yeah. from. Uh, uh, if, if they, how do they per personally assess the future of local media? Is there some, is there some future for local media? Of course, we ask the journalists themselves how they see the development, and we found that, well, as well in the U.S., uh, that's the study of Damian Radcliffe and colleagues, which was done in 2017. There's well, much or slight optimism there, very or slightly positive and majority about the future of local media in, in Austria, this is even much stronger. So most Austrian local journalists are really saying, we do have future, we do have a perspective, we will be there in one or the other field working there. So this chart shows like the Austrian numbers. This shows the Austrian numbers. And if and you take the, the, US the, the, US, the US figures. And, uh, the point is, doesn't everybody say that? And when we did our studies over the years, we could see a process with the overall picture of what, uh, what journalists say about their, uh, opti about their optimism, how optimistic are, but are they that their job will uh, be successful and their media companies will, will be stay in the market. So we saw a growing number of overall in journalism, also in Central Europe, of people who were sort of pessimistic. But the local journalists, there's only a very small, a very, uh, small number of them who says, well, we feel quite insecure or very insecure in what we are doing. So the question for us, of course, that's what's with something we could discuss then uh, more in detail. Why is this so? And is this, I mean, are they right uh, with their optimism? Especially because what we can see is also the workload. So we did a lot of details about what's the workload, what, what has changed in the newsroom, what's the digitalization. May, may uh, I yeah. just yeah. Um, yeah. Um, uh, This is a very good point to ask uh, to ask Joost. Um, what did change in your newspaper for like like di between print and online? Is it like the readers are getting digitized? Is it the journalists getting digitized? What's the, about the audience? So who 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 how do you um, spread the news, actually, in your, in your newspaper? Well, in my, in my opinion, um, to be digital, it's, that means it's not a question of uh, hardware or software. It's a question of mindset. Mm -hmm. So it's mindset. And that b belongs to the newsroom and that belongs to our audience. Mm -hmm. So they are, they, we will both have to be, and we are digital. And that means, in, in our work, we, we try to use any channel we have. Mm -hmm. We try to, to use um, print for deep reading, for example, and we try to use a digital uh, channel for fast news. And we, we try to <laughs> invite people via social media, via Facebook, for example, to get in contact to us and um, to talk with us about topics which are uh, important for the region, mm -hmm. we try to do. Mm. Uh, Peter, you are the author and you marked the word uh, slow news. What do you think about the topic on, online um, print uh, 
for local news? Is it is important that local news are fast, or sh is there some stories behind, and how can you can you find them actually? Well, the fast news is extraordinarily important when we have something like what I described in North Dakota, mm -hmm. where people needed to know immediately that there was d danger, deadly danger, and they and they weren't informed. So that's an example, Yost, I think, of what you're talking about, yeah. where you want to get that word out. But the concept of slow news is that deep reading that you're talking about, and uh, I think believe, I hope, that more and more of us are, are realizing that material that is marketed to us as critical to, to uh, digest fast too often is completely unimportant and is a waste of our time and it's a waste of those who are purveying it. And so as consumers, to get back to your first mm -hmm. question, as consumers, we, we have to dictate more by how we spend our money and spend our time that, that we don't want to have this foisted on us, the fast material that's giving us the, the apparent satisfaction that is superficial at best. So uh, one thing I've heard the other panels on local news here in Perugia and which is often discussed uh, in, in relation to, to local news is that you should do like offline events or like other, other events. Uh, you, you you talked about um, you told me about an exhibition you yep. made. So you are not only engaging online, yep. you're mm -hmm. engaging offline. So how do you do it? Yeah, What's it, your it means uh, very important that real journalists are talking to real subscribers, to real um, readers, physically. And um, what we did is um, talking about the future of our region. We invited a photographer, a famous one in Germany who is a professor uh, at the University of Fine Arts in Bremen, and we invited him together with his master's students coming from all over the world, from India and uh, Japan, Germany, Poland, and so on, to visit our region for 10 days and uh, just to, to uh, create our own view on our region, the own perspective. So no postcard uh, uh, pictures, but uh, critical uh, photography. And they did it for 10 days, and uh, two weeks ago, we had the um, um, opening of an exhibition in an arts museum in our city, and we invited all our readers to come and to discuss with the photographers from all over the world. Why do you have this perspective to our region? Why are you critical and uh, what's the background? Mm -hmm. And we are going on now with several meetings the next weeks. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the um, perspective is a good uh, point in, the, in, in your context as well because you, uh, you had um, also had a look at the self-image of journalists and the role of journalists. How, how does it shift? Yeah. Or well, well, journalists, of course, as we all know, we, we have different roles. Uh, so mm -hmm. some is bringing out the news as objective as possible, so the understanding of uh, bringing the material that uh, in democratic, democratic systems we can discuss what's going on. But also, very often, uh, journalists try to be facilitators, and that's one important role of the, of the local media, of, of new discussions, of uh, bringing together people, so that kind of, we have different, word for, uh, different words for that in different systems, so that kind of audience engagement that's growing now, be it via uh, museum activities with international photographers, be it via uh, theater programs, be it like people, editors meet the people in whatever occasion uh, to discuss uh, transparently the topics uh, they, are, they are important for, for the paper, for not only for the paper, the channel, or the, or the TV station in the region, but generally for society. So there's a lot of activity in that. And I think that's one of the points where local media, as we can see, have a good perspective if they manage to do so, to play this facilitator role. Of course, there's the other role we all know, especially uh, in, in Central Europe, we discuss the role of the a and also in the US of the critical controller of the people who are controlling politics and uh, sort of forced power di uh, discussion we do have. But 
the most important one of, I think, in, in, in local media is bringing people together, bringing society together. So the, the, the shift we do have on all channels. And the other thing, maybe one sentence for, the, for using the chat from before again, we can compare the data uh, what do local journalists do and what do other colleagues do. So the one who were first doing new digital operation of all kinds, be it uh, Facebook Live or be it or whatever kind of producing uh, film news uh, on, 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 on the mobile phone and cutting it and set it, sending it out. The ones who were first to do that usually were the local journalists. That's because, of course, there's not so much stuff usually. The other thing is the quality, the standards, the technical quality standards very often are not considered as high that uh, whoever heard the story of how the New York Times wanted to teach its newsroom, the 2000 there, how to use uh, the iPhone for uh, production. Uh, and uh, this was a never-ending story which didn't have so much of a result. If you come to a small lo local uh, group and say, come on, we've been out there, there's the went there, take your, so that works somehow. So they, usually they are uh, the ones who use digital channels and digital technology, whatever, faster than the others are the local journalists. So that's, I think, very helpful for that uh, uh, faster connection between audience and, and, and journalists, and uh, which is, should be really one on eye level. It's not just a strategy, that's the other thing. I mean, it has to be yeah. a honest thing on eye level. People have, to, the citizen has to feel, we, the consumers, have to feel they really mean it. So, uh, and that's, well, the second point. Yeah. A very, sorry, a very, very important point you, you raised, um, like that the role of journalists shifts and that um, they have to, to speak on an eye level. And we're sitting here on this podium behind this desk and one key finding of uh, successful um, local journalism or community journalism is that you get in touch with your audience. And so I would already now uh, like to invite you as an audience um, to discuss with us and to get in touch and so that it's not just the four of us discussing here, but really to, to get in touch with yeah. you. So Stefano, um, because we need a microphone to, to for, the, for, the, for the recording. I think that's maybe that's the point. I think what we see that so media cultures and local cultures are so different and there's so much experience in the room as I yeah. can see. This one, I mean, maybe goes to Peter, uh, for instance. Um, yeah, at the West Coast in the US, you have new competition uh, for local newspapers um, coming from system, neighborhood systems like Nextdoor. Do you, do you see this as a challenge, as a, uh, maybe as a threat, or a, or a new chance for, uh, for local journalism? It would be lovely to think of it as a new chance and certainly not as a threat. Anything that we can add to the mix is only healthy. But in terms of, of the problems that we're facing, and, and I'm, you guys are the optimists as we discussed at dinner last night, and, and I come from the new world where we have always been the frontier and we're always saying how great it's all going to be in the future. Of course, we're laboring under the perversion of the Trump era and some of that trickles down. And an example is with local news. And, and still, most studies indicate that most Americans are getting their news from local television. And let me answer that in, in a way by bringing an example from Eugene, the city where the University of Oregon is headquartered, city of 200,000, three local television stations, two of them now owned by another diabolical corporate group, Sinclair Broadcasting. Sinclair Broadcasting is the largest owner of local television stations or close to it at this point. And they are now mandating, as some of you may know, across the entire company that their news announcers read what are opinion pieces, editorials, op-eds that are the exact same copy dictated by the corporate headquarters and then essentially serve as an echo chamber for the Trump administration. So, so back to your point, if we can, whatever we can get that, that uh, is an alternative, while we hope 
the consumer is educated enough to be able to differentiate between what we would consider journalism and what we would consider propaganda in the American use of the word, that's, it's, only, it's only helpful to combat this kind of uh, corporate control that is eviscerating, to use that word again, local news in the US, unfortunately, sadly. I'm, I'm much more optimistic than Peter. And I, I'm moving I, yeah. to Hagen, and you're uh, going to hire me. All right, we do. Uh, I don't feel that uh, local groups, because uh, I think it's a challenge. They remind us to do our job as professional. Uh, and if we are on an um, eye level to our consumers, to our subscribers, to the people in our region, uh, in that case, we are just indispensable. We are indispensable. And uh, it all depends on your intention. Uh, that means, for example, um, you can use social media like uh, you mentioned Trump. You, you promised you wouldn't, but you yeah. did. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. We promised. We yeah, we <laughs> promised. Uh, and uh, if you have a look, look like uh, Trump is on Twitter, he has 45 million followers, but he does only follow 45 or 46 people. And that means it's not proof of democracy. If you're not interested in listening to your people, you just want to send messages. And our profession is to listen and to talk to the people, just to, to create a dialogue. And that makes us indispensable, I'm sure. It was interesting to hear that point. I, I don't know who's been over there on the, in, on the panel where Jeff Chavez and Alan Rusbridge are, so some of my heroes in the digital world is like Alan. And when he says one of the key points he said there in the discussion is, uh, do journalists, do media find out uh, how they can listen, how they go away from the vertical thing to the horizontal thing and how they can listen to their audiences uh, to speak with them on eye level. One, and one other interesting sentence I've heard from Jeff and from many others before I said that's especially one of the privileges we do have with technological development and the internet. So, and there always comes the sentence, this was never possible before, which isn't true. I mean, Remember the radio, Bert Brecht, the radio theory, let every receive a publisher also, which was the theory of the radio. And what, how did it end? Germans in the room, German-speaking people know it, especially with the Volksempfänger, where there was no way of sending out messages. So that's, it's a little symbol, symbolic thing. We have to remember that we have to discuss, of course, the political surrounding. So that's uh, terrible what's going on in the US for many liberals in, the, in, in Europe, what we can see, and this is, is, has its results for local journalism, for national journalism. On the other end, we have some high journalism quality coming out of that and audiences that are reconsidering what they have with journalism. So, I mean, yeah, not talking about, I mean, we're talking about local change. we have brought up Trump, so, we must yeah. say yeah. that in many respects, it's reinvigorated journalism in the US, no question, and it's reminded the consumer yeah. of the, the critical importance of what it is that we do. And we can even do that better, so bringing us back to our topic on local levels. So that's something very not only useful, and, and we can do it under all, under all or species under all ideas of journalism we do have in the liberal model. So the, the user and reader and viewer is welcome because a loyal user pays money for what, whatever. In the more democratic corporatist model we have in Central Europe, so bringing all in the society, so that basically is the idea of democracy and that's the work, especially on the local level, to have uh, that exchange of, of, of opinions. And in Southern Europe, even more where you have very often that polarist model, so people want to discuss, so let them in and not only, mm. on, not, on, not only do that. One of my th theses was, when I was preparing for this panel was that um, local journalism is kind of a backbone of democracy because it really gets, gets in touch with the people where they are. And if, for example, we have the scenario that, um, that the internet is shut down, which is technically, well, a bit difficult, but nevertheless, you can block, you can block websites or so, you need to have a, a local resource, a community or a printout how to reach people, and I think uh, Peter's uh, example very well showed the, 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 the physical dangers that may be, without, may be there without a community being able to talk to each other. And yeah, 
So uh, one question I would like to raise in this context is also um, how does the role of a journalist then really shift? So we, we talked about this uh, platform provision that local news should have, but what, what is the real, the, the very journalist, what, what capabilities does he have to have or she, what abilities, what's, what's like prime virtues and things that he or she should have? Like for that sounds like something for Joost because he's immersed in that, yeah? Yeah. Well, it sounds simple, but you have to be really interested in people, in your people and in your region. And uh, maybe it's necessary to love the people and the region you are working for. And uh, that means to set out and to leave the newsroom and to be uh, on your way, to be outside in the region, to talk to people. Um, for example, uh, we are uh, using, uh, f we call them future labs at uh, the Westfalen Post. That means we invite our colleagues to apply for a lab once a year. Uh, five people, five colleagues are coming together from different editions. Normally they do not work together. And then they, uh, they spend a week uh, in uh, co-working spaces or in cafes or wherever. And, uh, they talk to people and they find topics and then they create and develop um, a major topic and we, um, we develop it and we play it out all over uh, all our editions, print and digital. That's what we do. So we, we try to find topics which are really important for the people we are working for. Hmm. You're both very uh, experienced in, in training journalists. What does this mean for, I'm coming from a training organization, what does it mean for the training of journalists actually? This like new, new, um, I mean actually getting in touch with people is not new and like, like so, but what's, what's new about it? Well, there, there perhaps isn't anything mm -hmm. new about it and there shouldn't be anything new about it. It should be as old as journalism, but perhaps we have to, remember, remind ourselves, remind others, and, and uh, connect to the community in a way that shows care, if, if not love, at, at least care and, a, and an appreciation for the role that we take and a realization that we, we have to get out. I'm, I'm looking at the, the room and, there, and this is not in any way a criticism, but so many people are, for example, my colleague and friend Daniela, Krauss there is uh, on her, her machine here, her iPhone, and, and we have to teach our journalists, I think, and remind ourselves that we have to get past that, that uh, digital connection that so often allows us to be in a place as beautiful as Perugia and be looking at the screen instead of looking at the architecture or tasting the gelato. And th that, that is uh, of, of crucial importance. There's one exercise that when I brought American students to study in Vienna with uh, the Forum Journalismus und Medien, and they were assigned to go up to people in the street and smile. And for those of you who know Vienna and Viennese, you know that nobody in Vienna ever smiles in public. And so they would go up to these people and smile, and the people would not smile back. And then their further assignment was to engage them and say, excuse me, I just smiled at you. Why didn't you smile back? And all of the students came it's back at the, tough. it was very, very tough. tough. And at the end of the term, the students came back and said, that was the worst assignment of the entire experience, <laughs> but it was the one that pushed them the most to remind them of the importance of that person-to-person -person interaction. Mm -hmm. Well, just would uh, add one point. I think there's no reason to, to complain if we are talking about what's called disruption, it's, it, because it's a process uh, undergoing all these industry, industries for maybe 20 years now, and we are part of all that. So um, we have that in common, and that means, to me, that means in our newsrooms, we have to talk about quality, we have to talk about target groups, we have to talk about planning the next week, the next month, and so on. And to be honest, uh, we, we didn't do so for a long time. So now we behave professional like other industries, that they do it for years or for decades. It's part of our business model.
Well, I think that's one, one of the changes or that's the ambivalence that's the complicated things we do have. On the one hand, so all the needs of all the technology, all the, out, all the, all is in the internet thinking in the newsrooms, people sitting there and working on their materials and not going out and uh, to smile to whomever or to ask the intelligent question less than before. So I've been in the profession also as a journalist some more than 30 years and that really has changed. Everybody has that long experience for good reasons. We all know that. So one point might be to rethink, of course, that attitude, especially on the local level. So that's crucial there. If you don't do that, you will lose your audiences and you will lose your competences and you will lose Finally, you will lose <laughs> your media. Uh, that, that's the one thing. The other thing is, uh, is what, you, what you mentioned is the thing about professionalization, because there's a new form of competition mm -hmm. in the digital world. So we have all that very intelligent experts out there doing their web blog uh, much better than one expert in journalism in, uh, could do. Or, uh, so we have to redefine journalism and to, to, to characterize Everybody has to do that in his media operation, but also generally speaking in our societies, what makes good journalism? And not only on a local level, and what makes professional journalism? What's the, and what's the difference to, to uh, citizen journalism that can be very interesting and to all kind of communication we have out there? If we can't do that, then we'll have a problem with the profession on, on, on all levels, not only on the local level, but even more important there to do that. So Coming back, like on the title of our of our panel, what makes uh, local journalism so powerful? Is it then the audience and the interaction with the audience that makes um, that makes local journalism so powerful? Well, definitely, or right? at least has the potential. Not everybody does it, and not all the media. Uh, have a real interest, and not all the journalists are made for it. I mean, you, most of you will know colleagues uh, who are almost afraid when they are going out and uh, who do not, I mean, I remember the beginning of, of email when colleagues asked, do I have to answer? Do we really have to publish an email address in, <laughs> so people will send us material and do we have to answer? So that was, and that's not so long ago, that's 20 years ago actually, a bit more than 20 years. So we still have that people thinking that way and that's a problem if we have it. The potential we do have uh, communicating to be, have the interpretative citizen that's what we want, and to help people with the material we can gather as professional journalists with all, uh, all our professionality, uh, that's, that's the big chance to that, that interaction, that uh, audience engagement. If we don't do that, well, then, 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 it's, well, then it's a lost battle. Yeah, just, just you, you mentioned the word, uh, oh, sorry, uh, target groups um, is one, one powerful key factor of uh, successful or powerful local news that you know so much about your target groups, about your audience, that you really can dive into their needs and their wishes? Well, to be honest, we are at the beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. so, but uh, so many informations are public, so you can get them from wherever you want, like uh, uh, Zeno's milieus and um, other stuff. And moreover, we do know little about our subscribers, and we do know little about people who should or might read our regional newspaper and subscribe it, print or digital, for example. So it's a reason for setting out and to, to start to get more information and to create a product which is worth 35 euros a month, any month, because there's no household fee anybody has to pay to read a regional newspaper. Mm. Peter, is it, is it the quality? Um, it's the information, and, and I, I'll bring another example yeah. from the States, and before I moved up to Oregon to the university, I lived in a town some of you may have a mental image of, it's Bodega Bay in California, and if you think uh, the birds and think Hitchcock, that's the neighborhood, mm -hmm. and that, that's, a, that's a, yeah, don't, don't, don't cry out in fear, it's a, it's a, a village of a thousand and the newspaper for many years was the Bodega Bay Navigator. And what was critical was information. Who was born? Mm -hmm. Who died? Who got married? The car crash, who got injured? Were they still in the hospital? What house burned down? How's the fishing fleet doing 
How's the salmon season? How does it compare with last year and with the crab season? Mm -hmm. These were critical aspects of this weekly newspaper that went out of business. And when it went out of business, the collapse was consequential. The regional newspaper, the Santa Rosa Press Democrat, would only come out to see us if there was a crisis. They did not have a reporter. They did not have a stringer. We, we were secondary to the county seat. And so different replacements were attempted and still are. There's an active blogger, but he has an extraordinary point of view. He is uh, um, prejudiced against Mexicans, and we have an influx of uh, Mexican immigrants. And more and more, we're seeing notices, ad hoc notices, at the post office being taped up on the door of the post office. So-and-so died. The memorial service is here. Mm -hmm. Or the farmer's market will be on Wednesday at noon instead of at 2 o'clock. So these very basic roles of a community newspaper are critical that is informing the community and bringing the community together with a, with a collective curriculum of knowledge. Those are very interesting aspects. So, please. Uh, please, please uh, if you have a question, uh, um, wait for the microphone. Thank you. Technology. Yeah. We'll understand the question. Uh, no, try. but it's for, it's for, kind of information which is vital. My question for you is how, how local is local today because under the local we have a really big uh, uh, area which is hyperlocal which cannot be covered by local news media because of restriction of business model because we cannot employ 100 journalists to cover every single place like this. I, I don't know where this experience comes from, but that's a very important point. That's a very good question, Tricia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I could see, see maybe, maybe I could help out with some uh, experience in Spain we do have. So we have a very critical media market, so many journalists unemployed, and so many find now new initiatives, new activities, and can live from it on a hyper-local level. So that's people, they know their region, and they do their digital thing. They are for a very small village and or in corporations there. So many of our students of the university are working there. We are teaching. They know when they get out, they won't get a job in the big companies, not on the regional basis also, be it El Mundo or uh, El País. They are all cost-cutting, stuff-cutting. But what you have is a lot of hyper-local things, and very often they find some new forms of networks so to help each other with the financiation, with, with uh, whatever, with the ads selling and uh, what you need also for, for make a living out of it. So with professionals, you can do that. Or the other thing we see is, is on the hyper-local level, more integrate, like in Austria, is one of the biggest uh, weeklies, or we, chain of weeklies, uh, region, uh, which is regional media, regional media group, reaching 50% of the Austrians on a weekly basis with all the different regional editions. But they integrate the uses, like that kind of, Edit, uh, civil editors with bringing in the hyperlocal news and they're editing it and they have a good uh, system of, in some places, not in all the same, but in some regions they have a very good system of moderating that content and somehow by this guaranteeing a certain quality of in information also on the hyperlocal level because they couldn't afford to have 1,000 journalists in all, the, in all the small areas of, of Austria, but they can have, say, 50 all over Austria, who are moderating 5,000 and their materials every day on a hyper-local level. So there's different answers to that or different strategies, we'll see. But it has a, of course, it's of real importance, as you say. Yeah, yeah I agree. It's a, it's a, it's a crucial uh, question. And uh, I'm convinced uh, um, our very existence depends on um, whether our subscribers and people in the region are convinced that we, local media, is really necessary or not. 
And yesterday we had a discussion about centralization of newsrooms and Steffi and Wolfgang are in the audience. And uh, that means um, where do we put our resources? Uh, what is important to, uh, for our really future? And I think it's really important to be in the region, to be local, if possible sub-local, and um, to, to offer a high quality, high quality standard, because that makes the difference to all these local blocks um, um, which we are competing with. Just one note to this, which is fast, and that is we have to remember as consumers and we have to, I would think we have the responsibility as professionals to educate the consumers somehow, maybe by example, that this stuff has to get paid for. We are victims of this long period of expectation of information for free. And this water costs something, and this hall has to be rented, and this camera he had to buy. We have to be, we have to expect to pay for news. Yeah, I have a question regarding just what you said about, um, I, I work for a very small local paper in Switzerland, and uh, the main product used to be print. Everyone just bought the paper, they had a subscription, and now they decided to go online. And people need to pay to read the local news online, and no one will. It's just, they don't care. They don't care about the online product. We have like very little subscriptions. Uh, what is your take on, do you think there should be like a paywall for local news online? Well, the business models are well, questions we can discuss long. We would have to go into detail. Of course, we know from the digital news report, for example, that uh, people are in, in different countries are differently willing to pay for whatever local news, general news, specialized news. Usually, we see that there's a bigger chance for specialized or local, if you have, if, because this, if this is a content, a content you can't, that's, that's the rule. If this is a content that's relevant for whomever, which group ever, which you can't get any other place, then the interest in paying for it, if you do it really good and you do advertise it and so, is, well, there's a chance. Still, it might turn out that it doesn't, it doesn't work because maybe it's not relevant enough, maybe that's the audience isn't big enough for that. So you have to find out, you have to develop your business model, we would have to see in your special case and in many other cases. But there are, there are some we can find out there. Uh, so Central Europe, the German-speaking countries are very different from, from other places. So we find places in Scandinavia, examples, don't know, maybe there's some colleagues from Norway or other places here who could, could give us examples. We can find examples in Southern Europe where new initiatives are making money, not a lot of money, but are making money with what kind of ever paywall or, or subscription model or interesting apps they are doing because they are so specialized that 1,000 people are paying for that app and that makes money. So that kind of models we do have also. So I, I'm able to talk about German market and if you see, uh, have a look at all these business models, um, the German companies tried any model from metered to freemium and so on and I think to be honest, nothing really worked, uh, it didn't. Um, from my point of view, uh, it's not Im important anymore to have a look at scope, to just to reach as much people as possible. But it's more important to have a look at uh, loyal users, if possible. People who think you are important and uh, we are important. And we have to find, as Andy said, we have to find themes, topics, uh, pieces, which are really important and uh, which maybe are um, worth to be uh, a subscriber uh, of our newspaper in print and digital too. And if you offer all for free, especially your local news, you will lose your independence. Maybe uh, uh, give one big example we all know, or some idea, if Alan Raspitcher would be here, he could protest. But, uh, uh, seeing the digital process of uh, something like The Guardian that was enormous, making a small regional trade union paper, this was The Guardian, one of the 10 or maybe five biggest digital news operators of the world, or of the English-speaking world, the Western world, was a real success, no, an unbelievable story, but they're still not making money. They're yeah. losing a lot of exactly. money, and if yeah. the trust wouldn't finance that, yeah. well, nothing would have happened, wouldn't have been possible well, at all. So 
one idea might be if they would have invested all that energy in Manchester, uh, digital energy to serve their audience they knew so very well, and maybe a little bit in London and other places, maybe they would have made money. Yeah, yeah, That's but, just an but idea. It, but the but, problem is us. We have to pay for it. So who in here looks at The Guardian at least uh, a week, every week or so? Who, lo who looks at The Guardian? Now, who has seen the yellow banner saying, send us some money? And now who has sent some money? Okay, so okay. that's the problem. Yeah. That's yeah, the problem. Definitely, we yeah. are the problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and what you say about your newspaper in Switzerland, it, it's, it's so sad to know. They were ready to pay for the paper. They're not ready to pay for the digital. Maybe there's a lesson there too, that there is something of value to this that we have to remember. And very often, I mean, from the point of research, which is always easy when you're not in the newsroom every day and have that difficult process of legacy media changing the newsroom and transforming, transforming the thinking in the newsroom. But very often, when you have that paywall idea, people want to sell, uh, sell the old stuff they always did in, in the digital and, well, which doesn't work. I mean, you have to find your key competence, and that's, this can be local, this can be serve a special audience, a special target group, but you have really to work hard on that. And if you don't do that and just say, well, we did some job and we really were working, but not knowing exactly what it is, and it's still the old, sort of the old journalistic material, which is better off in, in print or in TV, but not online, then you won't get money for it. So, one last question. Like in the back, please. I work, I work in a small uh, of a broadcast station in Holland, and when I interview someone, it's like, uh, oh, I'm on TV. It's a one, uh, it's a once in a lifetime thing. But when you interview the prime minister of Holland, it's like, oh, another journalist, another interview. Do you think that makes the interview different? That makes the article different? You, you mean um, doing an interview for a local newspaper makes a difference to making it for a national newspaper? Yes, because the local people might not um, get might on TV anymore. Or might have other questions or other interests? Is it pointing at that? Uh, I didn't get what you mean. Yeah. Do, uh. So it makes a difference to do an interview for a local newspaper. That's what you asked. Yes, because that they are not uh, they are less popular than the prime minister. So, so if, if I got the question, uh, so the point is, of course, of course, uh, it it should make a difference if the interviewer comes from a local media station, because otherwise it would be more of the same. You have a national level all the time, so you you have to have something that's really the aspects of your viewers. And, uh, and uh, if you don't do that and want to play the big thing, well, maybe interesting, but then you should uh, change and, uh, your job and go to a, try to get a job in a big national TV station and ask the big national question. So, of course, there should be a difference in, in, in the local journalism. Yeah, you would do, if you ask Angela Merkel when she's in Hagen, you have definitely other questions, I would say, as the colleagues in, in, in Berlin. No? Of, of course. Uh, I think it all depends on your um, point of view. So I try to see any topic from a local and regional perspective. And uh, that would um, has an influence to all the questions we have, for example, to Angela Merkel, uh, whoever. And that means um, if we would do an interview with Angela Merkel in Hagen, for example, like Andy said, we, we just would like to ask uh, local and regional questions and topics and no national. Mm. But maybe your woman there in your village uh, in Holland is more interesting than your prime minister if your prime minister is going to stick to his media trained talking points mm. and she's going to say something about the community mm. that will help bring the community together or make the community aware of something that they wouldn't otherwise be aware of. So. I like her better than him right now. Mm. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much for this interesting panel. Here you have the um, our Twitter handles, and as a last thing, um, before thanking you all for being here, is like I would like ask any of you. Um, we've heard now so much in local news, and it was a wonderful panel. Why 
if somebody of, of the audience wants to get back in touch with you, for example, via Twitter, um, what could he or she talk about with you on local news? Just one sentence, please. Ah, I would be happy to, ha to hear all the experience there's out there. That's easy. I mean, that's, we are collecting materials and whatever experience you have, and maybe some now and then we could give help with another uh, answer in the context. So that's our role also as, as researchers. We see facilitators of new platforms and bringing people together, for example, with local experience who otherwise would not meet. So, well, let me know. <laughs> Yeah, I'm very much interested in opinions, in different opinions, of course, in, uh, uh, and in sharing experience. That's what I would like to do. And since I've been the bearer of all this bad news today, I would like to assign you all to look at the Denver Post from last week and an editorial in the Denver Post last week where the editorial staff is pleading, pleading with the consumers, with the audience, with the readers, to send some kind of a message to the ownership, because the ownership is eviscerating the newsroom and apparently pocketing enormous profits, an out-of-town venture capital company. It's symptomatic of one of the vicious problems we face, and so I'd love to hear from you after you read that, if you have some ideas, or better, write to the Denver Post and give them your ideas. Thank you so much. And uh, so if you want to get in touch on journalism training, on training on audience engagement, on the role of journalists, then I would, I'm happy if you get in touch with me or my colleagues at Fium Wien. So thank you very much for being here and I wish you a wonderful day. <laughs> <laughs>